Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Comics Rot Your Brain, the show where screenwriters talk about the comic books that we love, mostly from the 80s. Uh, I'm one of your hosts, I'm Stephen Bagatorian. And I'm your other host, Chris Derrick. And Chris, we are talking about a comic called Saber this week, uh, a comic created by Don McGregor and Paul Galassi published by Eclipse Comics in 1982, uh, between 82 and 85. We're going to be talking about the first two issues of Saber here, and uh, this is a book that Don McGregor tackled after uh, working on Black Panther over at Marvel Comics, and he and Paul Galassi teamed up for this sci-fi post-apocalyptic madness, and uh, this is a particularly bizarre and surreal comic book, and I think we we both kind of loved it for those reasons. Yeah, I think when we talk about this in the episode upcoming, we go a lot into the plot of this book because it's so crazy and it's so <laughs> bizarre. And I think, you know, I still think from looking at it just in hindsight, it, and I find this funny about books from this time because I was looking at something from Escape from New York recently too. It's like the way people picture like 20 25 years into the future back in the late seventies and early eighties was like the world was going to shit. <laughs> it was yeah. Like, apocalyptic wasteland. Like, Oh my God, it's coming soon. We're in a lot of trouble. I'm surprised people even like, <laughs> surprised there wasn't so many more suicides because people, just the, the vision of what people were thinking could be like the fear was so palpable. Um, yeah, That's so right, crazy. So, so it's so it's, it's out in 19, 1982, you know, um, just to give people some context of the time, what was going on pop culture wise. So at, like in 1982, like Marvel, what did they put out? Oh, so so this is the first year that they they put out the Wolverine, that limited series written by Frank Miller and drawn, I mean, written by Chris Claremont and drawn by Frank Miller. Uh, and th that was the first time that the, the character was ever done in like you know some sort of solo spinoff thing it was also the year that x-men uncanny uh issues like 168 was out which which gave us nimrod and 174 which uh gave us a return to the days of future past storyline and then in the movies what was out that year the top movie of the year was et followed by tootsie and then officer and a gentleman you know, we also had Poltergeist out that uh, Poltergeist came out that year, and so did get this in the top ten of the top ten, the best little whorehouse in Texas. <laughs> it was one of the hmm. top ten movies of the year, which I think is kind of funny. Um, yeah, but so that's kind of what the world was like giving us pop culture wise when these guys at Eclipse decided to publish this book. Which, you know, as we were saying, um, it's so batshit crazy. And the art by yes. Paul Galaxy is is pretty much out is pretty much crazy out there. Okay, so what were you saying about the inspiration that, that they had for um Yeah, like so the inspiration for Saber was was interesting and we should say that here we're covering the first two issues of Saber that were published by Eclipse Comics in nineteen eighty two. Uh, which were actually a reprinting of the original Saber story that was published as a standalone graphic novel in 1978. And it is what some people refer to as the first American graphic novel. There is some controversy there, as uh, a lot of people point to Will Eisner's Contract with God as the first American graphic novel, and that precedes Saber. However, Contract with God was, in fact, a series of short stories. So can we really call it a graphic novel? Graphic novel um, Is that a misnomer? Uh, is it a stupid phrase in the first place, graphic novel? <laughs> because it's almost always a misnomer. As with Saber, the original collection was only 40 pages. So although it's a story, it's one particular story, is that really a novel, a graphic novel? It's 40 pages. Who knows? There's controversy there. Uh, different folks will say different things. But regardless, there's no doubting the fact that this was a pioneering work in the American comic book market. Uh, Saber was creator-owned, and it was created by Don McGregor and Paul Galassi, as we said, uh, published by Eclipse Enterprises initially, later to be known as Eclipse Comics. 
Uh, and it was the first American comic book graphic novel solely distributed in comic shops via the direct market. Uh, it's in the bizarre genre of science fiction swashbuckling, and the inspiration for Don McGregor came from watching Errol Flynn's movie Captain Blood on television. And he sort of mashed that up with a lot of sci-fi influence, you know, like you mentioned Escape from New York earlier, Chris. It's got some of that vibe combined with an old Errol Flynn movie. And uh, Paul Galassi based the visual look of Saber on uh, the, the titular hero on Jimi Hendrix and also uh, was inspired by Clint Eastwood's Man With No Name character. And so this is like a, a really weird stew of influence. And it all came to Eclipse Comics as a regular monthly comic several years after the original graphic novel was published. And, uh, you know, the artists changed over the run of the series from Paul Galassi to uh, later on, it was um, Billy Graham. And uh, Billy Graham also, who had drawn uh, Black Panther, which we said McGregor had written at Marvel. And uh, then the final artist on Saber before it was canceled was uh, Jose Ortiz. So um, Saber had a had a run there for 14 wild and wacky issues at Eclipse Comics. It was published bi-monthly, and it is a one-of-a-kind book. We are only covering the first two issues here today, but trust me, folks, that is more than enough, as you're going to hear from that breakdown of the plot that you alluded to, Chris. Uh, this plot in these two issues is enough for 20 issues of most comics. There is enough madness and insanity here uh, to give us all quite a lot to chew on. And, and I think we had a fun discussion about it. But uh, yeah, to anyone who has not read Saber, this is all going to sound fucking bananas. But uh, this is a this is a, an independent comic book in, in, the, in the early 1980s. And this is why the 80s were so much fun is because stuff like Saber was being published every month and uh, you never knew what you were going to find at the old comic shop. So yeah, this is, this is a really, to me, it's a defining comic of the independent era in 80s comics in America. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I don't know of too many books that were so... That at that time, or or probably around the next twenty years or so, that were so so unique, you know, and they were so singular in their execution. I mean, you mentioned there's only fourteen issues, and it ran, you know, chains of artists. But if you look at this book, you can see that like Paul Galassi probably went insane, you know, in terms of like doing the amount of work that he did. And he's like, I gotta stop, I gotta stop, my brain's exploding. Uh, but yeah, but I mean, but it's a testament to Don McGregor. Who um, he just had a lot to say, and 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 at this book you can find it uh, because there was an image reprint done, I think, in the early nineties or something like that. Yes, so, so that's right. You can't, you can't find the Eclipse books or in the back issue bins. Then you can look around for that image, like soft cover trade, uh, probably on probably on eBay or something like that. Um, and so now let's get onto the episode. But fans, if you like this content remember to like comment and subscribe we would love it and if you appreciate it then you know that's all we ask from you and now let's get on with the episode saber is the consummate hero the ultimate freedom fighter in a world gone mad when the story takes place the country has been devastated by a nuclear holocaust and and the ruling powers led by the villainous the villainous um, overseer have all but gained control of the world, and yet, despite their prisons and concentration camps, a few intrepid souls have escaped their claws, and one has even dared to fight back. In this first issue, then he'll meet Saber and learn why he fights back. He also meet the beautiful and dangerous Melissa Siren, who joins Saber's cause. And let's not forget the bad guys. There's the overseer, half man, half machine, who dedicates himself to ridding the world of its last hero. And there's Black Star Blood, a mercenary hired by the overseer to track Saber down. Although a mercenary, Black Star is a man of honor, and he jousts both physical and verbal with Saber, uh, which provides an added dimension to uh, to the battle. As we said, the art is by Paul Gulesi, who is best known for his work on Master of Kung Fu and many other books.
Netflix. So that's the intro. Oh, and this takes place. Get this. I love this. The year 2018. <laughs> the distant it's, future. The distant future from 1970. It's what? It's, it's 40 years in the future when this was originally written. Four yeah. years ago for us when we're <laughs> reading this. I think was the first thing I want to say is it was really, this is, it's, it was weird just to read that date and, 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 and to know that we've passed it, mm-hmm. but it reminds me of like when 2019 came along, and that was the year that the Blade Runner was predicting, was was envisioning the future. Like these two people were, they were creating these these books about the future, like 40 some years in the future, and they just had the bleakest point of view of what was gonna happen, which I think is fascinating. So that's the intro of the book. You know that is in the that that's in this book by um uh, the thing that came out by Eclipse, uh, Volume One, Issue One in August of of eighty two. Just oh, just to be be, be clear, it, the book was lettered by Annette uh, Kowecki and colors by Glennis uh, Wine, and there's and the, and the logo was by Tom Orzachowski, who yes. Pretty famous. Yeah. Uh, this, this is probably some of his, his earlier work. Um, so, Steve, before we get into the actual comic, let's talk about Don McGregor's intro to the uh, to the to the book, the, the reprint thing that, that the image put out. Yeah. OK, that's a really great place to start because uh, the intro is really something. It's a hell of a little essay written by Mr. McGregor here. And also, just to be clear. Uh, so we're talking about the first two issues that Eclipse put out of Saber, which were published in 82, which were published in color. However, those two issues constitute a reprinting of the Saber graphic album, which was published in black and white and came out in 78, also published by Eclipse. And that graphic album was the thing we, we were referring to previously as the first graphic novel really right, right. Um, for the direct market in America. And I think, uh, I think it's Dean Mullaney or maybe it's McGregor. I think it was in Dean Mullaney's piece in the comic where they talk about how they were happy that Marvel comics was taking inspiration from what they were doing. And like, I think it was like four years later that Marvel launched their line of graphic novels with the death of Captain Marvel, et cetera, et cetera. So Eclipse really were pioneers in the world of comics on so many levels in America. And Saber is actually a historical book of great importance in the American direct market. So that's just for the record, that's the graphic album, those two issues in black and white. And not for nothing, but the Paul Galassi art just looks especially stunning in black and white. Looking over that version of it, like the coloring's fine and looks good, but like the level of detail and just nuance in the the ink work in black and white is like it's pretty breathtaking. And I'm a I'm a big Galassi fan, and his work, of course, looks uh, unique and just one of a kind to say the least. Uh, clearly with his Starenko inspiration. And, and there's like a, there's like a stiffness and an awkwardness to Galassi's work. And like, everyone kind of looks like they're made of plastic almost. Like there's just, there's a real like deep weirdness to the way that Galassi draws, but I, I love it. And I find it really immersive. And like, if you just kind of give in to Galassi's weird way of, of drawing and designing characters and building a world, it's actually very consistent in what he's doing. But anyways, I know we're supposed to be talking about the McGregor essay, but I'm just kind of like flipping through these pages. And no, yeah, I can't no, this, lazy stuff is this, amazing. I'm excited. Yeah, to talk I mean, about look, that. And we'll talk about Paul's work shortly. I mean, the, the thing about Don's essay is he's writing this. Obviously, this is what, 22 years ago, he's writing this, but he's got he's so upset <laughs> about the mar- the way the comic market was when they first did Saber in 78. And he's got yeah. an argument about how the suits don't know a goddamn thing, which is the <laughs> refrain of every creative, like like anywhere, trying to do something that is not so easily digestible. Um, I mean, it's true. I mean, he's, he's outraged. He's very he's outraged. outraged. He's outraged. And, he, and here is his book is being, re, being, being reprinted. I think there's some, I, I, I don't know if there was additional Saber work done 
by image. Like, I'm not sure about that. I don't um, think so. We should double check that, but I don't think he mentions that maybe it might happen, but I don't think it ever did. Yeah. So to, to me, that lets me know that, that, that maybe that reprint thing didn't sell as well as, as he thought. Uh, but that, and there's, and, and, and I have some thoughts on that, which we'll get to later, but I think the most fascinating thing about McGregor's essay is his talk about how you have to really roll the dice as a creator. If you want to make something that like means something that stands out and, and I mean, to yeah. take a, to take a big swing, you have, I mean, it's, it is, there's financial ramifications that he talks about. I mean, I mean, like, I mean, like, like there's a sense you get that like, you know, him and his wife and daughter were skating on thin ice for a while. Yes. I mean, yeah. He talks, about I mean, it. he talks about the sacrifices that his family like, had to make. Yeah. Which I, which I think is kind of fascinating um, considering, I mean, look, we've talked about this before, you know, Nobody will get paid a lot in comics unless you're like a Rob Liefeld and you kind of like hit the jackpot in some weird ways. A few people like that, you know, maybe a Burn or a, or a, um, who's the guy, uh, uh other writer, uh, uh, Mark Wade, maybe somebody like that. Who's, sure. Who's, who's, but they, but they do a lot of work. And, and you, and you, ha we have to realize that when this, when Saber came out in 78, direct market was, direct market was nothing then you know because as he's talking about how this book is not gonna it's it's i mean like he knew that it was gonna break ground and but the people who were bankrolling it didn't i feel also there's a like when we did when we read that stuff about dick giordano in I, I, back when he was like you know that that, that addendum we did to thrill right Right. He was talking about how they were really trying to push up the direct market. I, I, it yes. wasn't strong yet. And that was like, in, what, that's 85, 86? So it's still like six years later, they're still yeah. going to have the direct market. Like, it's not, it's there, but it's not, maybe not, it's not competing. It was, so, not, it was so new. It was so yeah. fresh. You know? It was so fresh. You know, they like the direct market had just still been born in like the 70s and was really kind of just, just blooming in the 80s. But you're right about McGregor here in this essay. It's kind of funny when he talks about here at the beginning of the essay, he says, uh, 20 years ago, here was the common mantra you heard in the establishment halls of comic book companies, comic book stores could not support a comic book, period, end of story. Those comic book shops were a small, negligible percentage of the company's sales, certainly not of consequence, positively insignificant in terms of the successful sales of a title. If you believed anything else, you were naive. And so he's saying all this because they were selling this initial Saber graphic novel exclusively through this market. <laughs> and so, you know, he's saying that all the suits basically thought this was like a suicide mission and foolish what Eclipse was doing and like doomed to failure. And McGregor clearly is like, you know, one of these creative types, Chris, like you're saying, who's like got like an ornery kind of a spirit to him. And he's like, oh, what? I can't do this. You know, fuck you. I'm doing it. You know, I'm well, really going to do it. We're going to make it work. Yeah. Well, well, here's the thing. I can, I mean, so just so people who haven't read this don't know. So Saber is a is a is a black man, and the woman named uh, Melissa Siren is she's not just a white woman; she's a blonde woman, and they have a you know as a, a a sexual affair like 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 in the book. I can guarantee you that when he's pitching this in seventy eight, he's getting a lot of pushback. He's yeah. getting a lot of pushback. You haven't got a lot of pushback in 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 uh tw like twenty years later too in ninety eight, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's it was way more pronounced when the book. So I feel like you know, just I feel like he's setting himself up for a lot more, uh, a, a lot more like roadblocks. But just the way he's designed the character, you know, he's like, what am I gonna? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm. It's interesting that he. I just want to bring this up because I, most people might know this, but they might not know this. But it's like. Uh, you know, the Wachowskis had wanted Will Smith to be uh, to be Neo, you know, and it feels interesting that sometimes people view future stories, someone who's fighting for the revolution, they want someone black to be like, you know, the tip of the spear for that. I think that's kind of like, like an interesting, mm. um, I don't say a trope. 
but it's something that people are like considering, you know, as, as if to say there's a, a, and particularly in Saber in this book, when you, when you learn about his background, you're like, oh, like his background, his origin when he's a kid is priming him to be so like, fuck you to authority. Which, but I think it's kind of fascinating. Yes. But I, but I, but yeah, but I, th- I think that McGregor, like, he's like, I mean, it's I, like, he, he's fighting a battle that must, that must have been so hard. And, and, and I don't know, like, how this book did sales wise. It, it, I mean, it obviously did strong enough sales wise for them to decide to, to tear it down and then launch it to start the series. Cause, cause they, they wouldn't have done a series. Unless that graphic novel, you know, like actually did well. Right. No, absolutely. And Eclipse published the series for a number of issues. We should probably look that up so we can mention how many issues were published. Uh, Of course, we're just going to be covering the first two issues, as we said today, because these are some dense motherfuckers. Uh, These two issues took some time to read. Uh, so, uh, so I'm checking this thing, and there's there's at least 14 issues. So this yes. ran this ran the same. I mean, almost the same same amount of issues as Aztec Ace, which was I think we said ran 16 or something like that. Something like um, that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So 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 that's I guess kind of the setup for the book. Now we can get into the book, and we can get into the graphic novel or the first two issues of, um the the series though the actual kind of floppies that are sold i'm gonna say this off the rip this book is crazy this book <laughs> does some like storytelling tr- stuff that i don't i don't know if people uh, i think it's gonna be hard for people but it's well worth it because of what this of what the story ultimately does but it's so it, it does what like i've seen you offline like it throws you into a story and it throws you into like um like like if like if this is a movie, you'd be starting at, at you'd be starting at the halfway point. Oh yeah, easily, easily. You're in media res, as they say, and he is not stopping to explain things. Like you're just kind of in it. I mean, I will say that he does allow for an awful lot of expository sort of lengthy dialogue between Saber and Melissa in that first issue where they're kind of talking out some stuff that, you know, feels a bit clunky in a lot of ways by today's sort of storytelling norms because it's so dense and it's these very long discussions about stuff. But, you know, it's because we're already in the middle of a, of a story where clearly a ton of shit has happened and like, you got to somehow communicate something about what's going on, but it's an interesting decision because like, I'm just looking here with Saber and Melissa walking in this first issue and they just start having these, this, these very chunky conversations, um, you know, ah, I see you want me to reflect the grimness of our situation. The overseer has decimated that little reb- that little group of rebels near the ocean and brought the survivors here. It's grim, all right. Don't try to hide the fact that their deaths touched you, but this is all a ploy. The overseer getting the fly to come to him. You shouldn't feel smug about this little harassment foray. No harassment this time. I'm going to free those people. They do not deserve to have all their spontaneity, all their lusts and quirks cut away under the overseer's psychosurgery. Yeah, well, if I can get close to you with a solar condenser, they can get to you with weapons that are a lot less merciful. So that gives yeah, you an idea of the dialogue. It's it's yeah. dense. It's not exactly naturalistic, uh, but it's like it's in a melodramatic form that like if you kind of give yourself over to it as a reader it ultimately kind of casts a spell and it does become rather immersive the more you get into it. But I definitely don't want anyone to go into reading Saber thinking it's going to be like a Brian Michael Bendis Avengers comic full of snappy no. banter. No, 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 <laughs> not no, no. That. Like, absolutely not. I mean, and I, and, and I think that's what, um, yeah, I th- you're right. It's, I mean, I, I would say maybe, well, here's the thing. I'll let everyone know the first two pages is a splat is a splash page. That's got yes. that. It's got these. There's, there's there's three level three tiers in the on the, the dual page spread, and it kind of explains how the world collapsed. And yes. it's this weird thing where it's like where the pa- where e- the panels have like those um 
uh, there's the equation symbol, there's the plus <laughs> and the minus. It's and really the, clever. And the, it's, it's, it's really wild. And the division yeah. symbol, which people don't use when they're trying to create, you know, it's really interesting. Um, it's a really interesting like design. Of, uh, it's kind of like the you know the preamble you get in any of these movies. You know, like the thing in Mad Max where they show you about the world blowing up, everything like that. I mean, they did he, this interesting job that he does to set this up. But then he brings you in to Saber, and you're right. And it's like I mean, it's like 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 when they're walking and talking, it's definitely not like a movie. It's 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 more like a play <laughs> in, in terms of like it's it's trying to like convey a lot of backstory and set mood and tell them what they're feeling. It, they're, they're like soliloquies, you know, like, like I, I used to, used to try to wonder, you know, like what was the purpose of soliloquies in Shakespeare, you know? Mm-hmm. And I, and I just came to the realization one time I was like, Oh, that's the thought balloons, right? The sol- so the soliloquies are the thought balloons. Mm. And it's like, how do you get inside somebody's head to know what they're thinking? Because it's like, oh, you do a soliloquy. And that's how it works on, at least in the Shakespeare stuff. Now, we've gotten away from that. But I feel like that's what he's doing, like, here in this book. That's why it's interesting when you read it, because you learn about people's... Because he, he mixes, like, you know... Uh, like plot and backstory and forward momentum and like, you know, as well as someone's emotional state will all kind of happen in like, you know, like the same kind of like, like, like couple balloons, on, like, like in a few panels. So he's doing a lot. That's it's, it's like, like he's jumping through a lot of hoops as a storyteller to get you to get to get you into what's happening, and and he, they're talking about things that ha- that happened off panel that you know that you didn't see that you're never going to see, and I think that's kind of like it's this daring in a way, and I think about like what what comics were like in '78 when this was coming out, and I'm kind of like comics weren't this like. Um, they weren't challenging to the reader like that then. Not the, not challenging to the reader like that now, but they weren't like that then either. And I think that's kind of like a, um, I think it's his testament into believing the audience is very smart. And I think that's always kind of a battle that creators have that their financiers or editors or what have you, like a battle is like, they're like, the audience isn't smart. So you got to dumb it down. And the writers are like, no, 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 the audience is smart. The audience is smart. <laughs> And there's that battle that you always going to have and you see it here. And I feel like, I feel like if this book, let's just say this was, was it's, if it's 82 and this book comes out, this book could have come out through Epic comics. Right. You know, yeah, but totally. I feel like the guys at Epic are still, there's kind of old heads from Marvel, like Archie Goodwin and stuff like that. You know, he's a great editor, but he knows like, look, you got to serve it up in a way that people don't have to think too much. You know, they just want to be able to read and get in and watch the art and be sucked in. And I think that what he does a lot in this is, is that he doesn't subordinate his storytelling to the art. And I feel like he's lucky that he's got Paul Galassi doing the art because because yeah. Galassi's art is there's something he does throughout the book, and he, I've noticed this in like in like a lot of his art is he'll do these kind of like like these panel tiers where where people where there'll be a background and it'd be div- and it'd be divided into four frames four panels and the characters like move through each panel but the background doesn't move so it kind of feels mm-hmm. like it's the same image but you're moving it's like it's a really interesting way of showing a walk and talk and he does this in so much of his work um like it's in master of kung fu it's in almost everything of his that i've read that it, it, it's just his style and, and other people do it but oh, not yeah. as much as he does you yeah, know? I, see, I see a page right here where he's doing this with a uh, saber and melissa walking yeah yeah. yeah exactly what you're yeah. saying yeah. three panels with the same background yeah yeah that is that is definitely a, a cool technique that i have seen other artists do for sure but that's interesting that that's like a signature of galaxies i hadn't realized that it's, it's total signature because because he, like, he's done this back in 78 mm-hmm. you know and i've seen yeah. it in other books you know you see every once in a while but but he uses i mean because he he must use it like six or seven times in this little graphic novel you know it's yeah. it's, it's it's like it's like it's his it's a signature of his and i kind of love it because it's like again you talk about it's immersive or like he's not someone who's ever fucking around with the background because the background right. is kind of like this tableau that he uses to like design what the scene's going to do and it allows 
like like McGregor's like like story to be a little more a little more laconic at times. You know? <laughs> Good word, yes, um, yeah, and, totally, uh, yeah. It's 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 crazy. It's crazy, you know. Um, but so that's just talking about the story. So the story is so Saber. He's like he was part of like a rebel group at the coast, and his camp got wholesale slaughtered by the overseer and those who happened to be survived were you know t- were taken into slavery captivity and brought to the overseer's compound which is a defunct amusement park i it's think it's an amusement park say. yeah no that's what it is and it's a very surreal aspect of the first issue is you realize that you're in this post apocalyptic world with these rebels Saber and Melissa wandering through this sort of like dead, you know, ghost of an amusement park. And they're being watched on like closed circuit cameras by the overseer and like some bad guys who are in a control room somewhere who are like able to view them and are kind of fucking with them and, you know, trying to figure out how to capture them. Uh, It's a very surreal and strange first issue. And, you know, one of the bad guys um, is like a half human, half animal. Um, his name is uh, Grouse. Grouse. His name is Grouse. Yeah. Yeah. Grouse. And it says here, Grouse resembles a rapscallion refugee from an old animated cartoon, the kind Saber would view on dimensional cassettes in his younger days. Um, and Grouse looks like a giant, like like a rat combined with like a maybe a rat and a cat. Um, and he's, but he's wearing like an SS uniform. Like he looks like some kind of like stormtrooper kind of military dude and he's smoking a cigar and, and he's very violent. Uh, so this is just part of the surreal spectacle that is Saber. Saber feels like pure comics to me in the sense that it's, it's not something you can easily imagine existing in another medium. Like, Absolutely not. You know Absolutely what I mean? Like, there's so much weirdness here that like, this just feels like this is the kind of story that comic books are built to tell and like can do it so well, uh, particularly in the hands of just an extraordinary visual stylist like Paul Galassi, who's just handling everything with a plume. And my God, like his visuals are, are they're fighting a battle for space on the page against McGregor's words, because uh, I think McGregor is somewhat legendary for being like a real purple prose kind of a writer. And you see that in full bloom here. Like McGregor, I think is a real like predecessor to someone like Alan Moore in the sense like that McGregor's doing so much in the prose that it really feels like a novel in places here. And I think out of like American writers, like he sort of feels like he's in a similar school in a way to Doug Mensch, who we also read Aztec Ace from recently. And there were, were similar, similarly wordy constructions on the page where, you know, again, like you said, these were guys who were not dumbing it down for the readers, but they were mainstream writers, Mensch and McGregor, who wrote primarily for the big two. But then when they went off to do their indie shit, like Aztec Ace and Saber here, it was like, the shackles were off and they were just going to go insane, which is very much, you know, what these books feel like. Saber, I will say for me, was a lot easier to follow than uh, Aztec Ace was. I was not confused by Saber. I was uh, at times overwhelmed by the the crazy psychedelic spectacle of what was happening. But I actually quite enjoyed Saber. And although it was a dense and at times slow read, it was ultimately, I agree with you, quite rewarding. I really enjoyed these two issues. And I think it's one of those things about comics being as dense as they were. And this is like a very extreme example. And you can see some of the pages in our show notes. But part of comics being as dense as they were back then, it's like you might love it or hate it, but it did give the writer an opportunity and, and the artist as well to like really create this immersive environment that was casting a spell, I would say, because like you're just being forced to give the book so much more attention and time that like you kind of can't help but get sucked into this thing so much more than like the average comic today perhaps where you're just like flipping through it and it's just you know some snappy banter or whatever and not a lot of dense dialogue 
And, you know, I'm not saying this book would be for everyone, but there is something really substantial about it in the sense that like both McGregor and Galassi, like they're leaving it all on the floor. You know, like they're not like like they're they're not not playing around. They're not playing around. They're They're fucking going for it. I mean, look. I mean, like I said, they're challenging. uh, You said something really fascinating when you said that 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 McGregor's words are battling Paul Gillespie's art for space on the page. Yeah, because it is absolutely true. And look at some of these pages. I mean, it's just crazy. I mean, I mean, I I, you know, it reminded me of some of those pages we saw in like the. Uh, the Panner Brothers, the Panner Brothers thing with Grendel, you know the oh yeah yeah that totally. Movie, which is so much text, and I feel like you know the thing about comics now is you read them and the, and they just kind of use they're, they're never as enjoyable to me now because there's never I think about this now there's not enough story, yeah you know like I honestly yeah. like I I think a great a, 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 the, I think the high point of this like you know this dense kind of comic structure. Uh, that the that, books that we've gone over is probably Alien Legion. You yes. know, there's a lot of great, there's a, there's a, like the balance that they got of art and the amount of text on the page, you know, and how much story is being told because they were telling so much story in Alien Legion. It's just like the guys doing here. But it's, it, you also said it's like it's psychedelic. Like, like I'm going to go back to this thing about the amusement park. Just think about this now. So this is in seventy eight, and and to get and this is why you're right about how comics is the only thing that can handle this. Because if you did this as a novel, you couldn't get the the bonker shit that goes on in this. Like, <laughs> exactly. Like, like you could describe it, but it wouldn't be the same. And this is interesting about Paul Glacier, right? So he's drawing like these these mercenaries out in like you know the wasteland, kind of this Mad Max type of thing, and they get into this thing. But then when they get into the amusement park. They're doing that. You know, a part where they're like dancing in like 17th century dress, and it's like, <laughs> dude. But the thing is, he's drawing all that stuff. It's so like, it's so um, it's so it's the detail is so high end that you're like, oh, he's not skimping absolutely anywhere. And when they, and when they get to that pirate ship later on, again, the like he's not skimping. And today's artists. I think would skimp with that or they would shoot it. They'd frame it in ways that it was more close-ups, you know, and everything like that. If it's I almost feel like the way television is now where it's like in movies are now, it's just so many close-ups, so many close-ups and not enough like wide shots that yep. are showing you so much of the world and wide shots are harder on artists to do because they got to draw, you know, this shit I was saying about with, with the, with the glacy panel thing, like, like those backgrounds are so expertly done like they could be still lifes there's so mm-hmm. there's so much work in there in detail and then he's doing up art on it i mean fights and people moving and all this text it's it's it, it, yeah you're right about like like how much that they trying to bring you in to the world and put that storyteller spell on you in a way that i that i don't think comics do today anymore and and, and i feel like maybe it's just like the way that movies are on tv is that people don't like density, you know, and and right. density is 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 not a bad word in in entertainment because it's like, hey, get into the story. And but see, and the, the reason why I feel like most people who are in charge of 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 say giving somebody the green light is is they who don't like density, not mm-hmm. the audience. Right. As a, show, as a show like Game of Thrones, it was super dense. And, mm-hmm. and it was popular as shit. And a show like The Expanse is super dense and was popular as shit. You know, and it's and and the, the upcoming thing with the Lord of the Rings is gonna be like super dense. And I mean, look, I could couldn't say this on on a whole bunch of previous episodes, but like on Star Trek, like like Star Trek is a super dense universe. You know, I mean, working up a card. You know, and we had characters from Voyager and from Deep Space Nine. So we had to be able to deal with all seven seasons of Next Generation, five or six seasons of, of Voyager, five or six seasons of, of Deep Space Nine. All of that was at our disposal and that we had to respect. So that's yeah. like, you know, five, six hundred episodes of television that wow. are possible for us to have to kind of navigate to tell our story. And that, and, and I remember part of what I was doing when I was writing like some of the outlines 
or for for when we were doing the third season, which hasn't aired yet, is that my boss was like, "Can you give? Can you write a paragraph at the top of the document that summarizes what's happening to sort of bring the executives up to speed as to where sure. we are? Because they'll be fucking lost if they start reading this outline <laughs> and they don't know the, and, and they have no idea who these characters are because because we're bringing back people from before and they're like, who are these people? And um, and so. And but but that I again I feel like is the beauty of comics because you can do these little catch ups you can do these little recaps you you, you you know like there's no shortage of doing a flashback in comics like comics love doing flashbacks and people hate that in movies and TV but it's so integral to how you can tell a story in comics because particularly like when they do like the origin of Saber like in issue two of this second half of the graphic novel when it's like you're you you, you, i mean he's getting his memory wiped out and you're just going back and seeing stuff from his life and you're just like oh that's kind of fascinating like like how he grew up you know but the thing i want to say is about the the there's not going to say about the um um uh, the amusement park then it's the 78 it's like vegas it's it's like caesar's palace like you know in terms of like this it's this massive kind of like this you guys because like if you go to caesar's palace and go to like the to the form shop area. Mm-hmm. Like the ceiling has got like uh, it changes like the daytime and night, and there's clouds and shit. It's all kind of programmed into the lighting thing. And I, I was like, that's what he they're doing that in this book, and it's predating what they what they even thought about doing in in Vegas. I remember about fifteen or probably fifteen twenty years, you know, um, maybe not fifteen years, but at least ten years. And uh, I thought that was kind of fascinating because it's. Yeah. it's for a comic guy to do this, and this is a dead amusement park. I mean, I don't remember what Westworld was like. Maybe like Rollerball. I didn't think Rollerball did that. It's 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 interesting. It's really interesting what, what these guys were creating on that level of like, here's my world. Here's how fucking crazy it is. I'm not going to flinch with anything. Hey, folks, uh, sorry for the interruption, uh, but thank you so much for listening to the show. And Chris and I are just going to elbow our ways in here briefly to tell y'all about our Patreon. And we're hoping that you'll consider very seriously signing up for our Patreon, which is only two bucks a month. And for those two dollars for 200 pennies a month, which these days is not even a cup of coffee at Starbucks. It's so little money to ask for. And we're going to be offering you so much in return, but it would make a massive difference to us if you could sign up to be part of our show via the Patreon family because we're going to be offering you in return two free one-shot episodes. Okay, they're not free, but two episodes that are exclusive to our subscribers on this Patreon platform. And uh, these two one-shot episodes will feature Chris and I talking about books that we're not otherwise going to be discussing on the show uh, at some length. And you will be surprised by some of these books that we cover. And that's not all, though. For the two bucks a month, you're also going to get even more. Chris, what else did they get on Patreon? You will be able to send us questions for the Q and A show that we have planned. It's it's more than one, but it's the first one will either be uh, between seasons one and two, or it'll be sometime in season two, or be after. And you know, some, so we'll, something we'll figure out as we go along. But you'll be able to put questions in and ask us anything that we want to talk about. You know, who's our favorite indie pop? You know, like comic publisher editor we should talk about. You know, there's, totally. there, there's something like that, but you know, like you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. Just ask us any question you want about comics from the '80s, and we will get to that on the Q and A show. We will also uh, open up to subscribers only an opportunity to, to suggest what books we should read and cover for subsequent seasons. Uh, so please subscribe. We would so uh, so much appreciate it, and you get a chance to participate in the show and help the show grow and help us decide what books that we're going to cover. Um, I mean, sure, there's a huge list, but there's always ones that we want to hear what the fans want to talk about as well. Um, and so, Steve, what comic might you talk about doing your one shot? Okay, um, there is a comic that I might want to talk about here that was a, an underground comic that was published uh, way back in the, uh, the good old days of the 1970s. It was uh, considered part of the uh, underground comics movement in a sense. Uh, the book's called The First Kingdom, 
and it came out from roughly the years 1974 to 1977, and uh, it was a 24-issue, 768-page comic that took its creator, Jack Katz, 12 years to complete. And it was an underground comic, ostensibly, but it had very science fiction kind of concerns and vibes. Uh, It's a sci-fi fantasy story that opens in a post-apocalyptic world, and it's got all kinds of madness going on, gods and goddesses, apocalyptic sci-fi. It's a really epic story with an unbelievably dense and detailed art style. the comic had a lot of fans amongst other cartoonists at the time. Jack Katz was admired by such people as Will Eisner and Jim Steranko, and even Jack Kirby had very positive things to say about the work that Jack Katz was doing. And comic book historian R.C. Harvey, according to Wikipedia here, believed that Jack Katz was the first person in comics to pursue a personal vision at such length. And so he was quite a trailblazer. He was a unique figure in comics history. Um, And I've never really looked at his work with any degree of detail, but I did happen to buy a complete set of the First Kingdom off eBay last year. It's a wonderfully bizarre looking underground comic. So I've got all the floppies and I'm excited to dive in. And I think I'd love to talk about it in one of these episodes here. And uh, Jack Katz, by the way, happens to still be alive. He is 96 years young. And uh, the man is uh, from Brooklyn, New York, originally. I don't know where he lives today, but um, I hope he's doing well. And I'm excited to check out his work finally after hearing a lot about it. So The First Kingdom by Jack Katz. That's something I will be covering on the show. I need to get a copy of what you bought. I want to read this. It sounds <laughs> it's pretty wild. It looks incredible. No, like the art, the art style. Everybody listening to this, look up The First Kingdom jack cat's comic online the art style is mind-blowing it is extraordinarily detailed and very very uh ahead of its time it's wild looking work it's beautifully drawn really beautifully drawn anyways that's one of my books chris what what are you thinking what's uh what's in the chamber for you for these uh solo episodes i'm gonna read uh, it's a single issue it's Mm -hmm. uh, issue issue number 32 of marvel premiere it hmm. has the character, uh, this is done by Howard Chaikin. It's a character named Monarch Star Stalker. And yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a book that I heard about for a long time. I can never get my hands on it until eBay. And I got on eBay about maybe three or four years ago. I read it. I loved it. I was fascinated by mm-hmm. it. I, I, it's, I, I, I always kind of love that mid to late 70s sci-fi that people were doing. I think people were like really, really influenced by like psychedelics in a way that they weren't later, you know. <laughs> yes, and, it, true. and and, and yeah. so, not that I think that I know that. And it's and mm-hmm. and and so it kind of like it, it kind of like bleeds into the work of these comic artists stuff like that. And this is one of those books that's it's early Howard Shaken, you know, predates what you call it, predates uh, American Flag. I mean, it's it's it's, it's working for Marvel. It's like seventy eight or seventy seven or something like that. I can't remember when, but that's mm-hmm. the book that I feel I might cover in our um, special one shots that you will be able to get. If you subscribe to this Patreon uh, for $2 a month, please fans, we would enjoy it and love it and appreciate you very much. Um, And now we will get back to Comics Rock Your Brain. And and Paul Galassi, I mean, fuck, like, I wonder how old he is when he's doing this book. I think he's like pretty young. I think he's... I think he's still fair, a fairly young man. And this is like, this feels like the work of a young artist who just has a ton of fucking energy and devotion to what he's doing. Because yeah, this is extremely time intensive looking work. Um, Galassi in 78. Let's see how old he would have been. Uh, Paul Galassi. Um it's funny, he'd be like 50 now. I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> so he, he, was born, he was born in 53. So he was what? Uh, so that's what, 25? 25. Wow. Well, yeah, he was a young man. I mean, wow. this is really extraordinary, impressive work for a 25-year-old artist. I mean, yeah, this is like, it's amazing. I mean, it's very much kind of steeped in the Steranko influence, but the way that Glacy draws has this like really just bizarre rigidity to it 
and all the characters feel very like just very uniquely posed and i i want to say stiff but i don't mean it as like a as a pejorative term it's just part of the way galaxy draws people and they they have like very odd poses and just interesting ways of moving but it's very consistent like his universe and the way he draws it's just consistently odd looking but i i actually love it i'm a big fan of glazy's work well well, it, well well yeah i mean i mean you know i i, could, I, mean, I might we might have said this before but in other podcasts but it's like first thing i saw him do was on master of kung fu sure. and, and and for his you know like you said like that stiff style of drawing that he does and fighting and like the snapshot of action that he gets is almost like like, like you don't want that for a kung fu book, you know, hmm. because it feels. But he made it work. Yeah, you know? it was really, really fascinating the way he made it work. I mean, it's. I mean, I mean the thing about his work that it's, uh, you know, you say Steranko influence, but I remember there's that book called like How to Draw Con- like How to Draw Comics of uh, the Marvel Way. Right. I was looking yep. at the way that uh, Jack Kirby drew. And Jack Kirby, and I think like, is it maybe Sal Buscema or John Buscema like did the art in that? I think Buscema, like, uh, John, John Buscema. John Buscema, yeah. And it's like, but he's talking about there's certain kind of like, if you're going to do action and someone's like, like you know, like if someone's throwing a punch, right? There's the, the full cock back and there's this, you know, and you can go all the way through the moment to, to the punch, you know, and it's like, and Kirby's and Bissemer in the Marvel way is, hey, like get that arm all the way cocked back in the one panel. And then the next panel is like the complete follow through and the guy's head is all night back. So you, you can kind of feel that movement from panel to panel. And, right. and, and, and Galicia doesn't do any of that. Like he totally like has, like he's never read that book. It's almost like he's not read a Marvel comic except for like <laughs> Dr. Strange and, 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 and fucking Nick Fury. Cause he's the damn, uh, like you said, the, there's a Steranko influence because it's so much like what what Steranko was doing in the, in those Nick Fury books. It's it's um um and it I mean it feels like that. I think that panel design thing where you walk across the background. I think Steranko did that too. Now that I think about it, but not nearly as much as as what Kawasi does. And right. you write, I mean, there's that really famous shot like in here where he's like, it's a low angle shot and he's putting the pistol up in the air. It's like, a, I mean, I mean, that's like so quintessential Paul Galassi art that, cause I've seen him do that front, that pose on, on, on like, I think that's the, I think that's the, it's like, that's, that's the Nick Fury cover or something like that in a, or a reprint of Nick Fury that I remember. And, mm. um, and I'm, I'm like, Oh, this, this guy is like assistant and shit. Like his art, like it's interesting that his art really hasn't evolved in maybe like 30, 40 years, but not, that's not a bad thing. It's, but, but, but he's like, he's pared it down. Like he doesn't do the same yeah. amount of detail. He doesn't, he doesn't need to, cause he knows, I think one of the things that happens when you, when, when you get better as an artist is you go, Oh, I can do with one line. What I used to do with 10, you know, yep. and, and, yep. and you realize totally. that at the more that oh like there's that one perfect line i gotta just to, you know this i'm gonna put down the ink it and it's gonna be this and that's what happens with like just practice and practice and practice and, and glacy does that fantastic and i mean he's shown it here now but, but, but his work even i, I got some i remember reading something in his like i don't know the last maybe 10 years and it's still the same quality you oh know? i think you were reading didn't you say you were reading six from sirius a while ago yeah, I'm still reading it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. 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 I remember it. That's more more classic Galassi. And it's it's it's, the, it's around the same time period. Well, but that's like like eighty four. So it's, yeah, it's a little little later. Yeah. So he's what about thirty then? But his art is still the same. You know, like mm-hmm. this, this like these weird facial constructions. Like he's someone who I feel like, um, he does reference for background, mm. but not for people. Yeah, I don't think he does for people either. You're right. They look very distinctly just kind of of a Galassi mold. And I would be very surprised if he used photo ref for people. I don't think he does. Um, I will say that Don McGregor does not make things easy for Paul Galassi here. Like some of the stuff that's being described here, particularly at the climax of issue two, just seems like a nightmare for an artist. If you get this script and there's a ton of characters who are on horseback and like suddenly like you know 
I think it's well known that horses are one of like the most difficult things for artists to be asked to draw in motion. They're just a huge bitch to draw credibly. And then you've got like oh, a, yeah. a oh, train, yeah. I mean, you've got like a, a monorail, like a, you've got a giant train crash crashing with like some horses and like, you know, a huge gun battle and, and like a bunch of characters, like just, there's so much crazy shit going on here at the end. And as this wild battle you know, with dozens of characters plays out. And I'm looking at a panel here where, where it looks like there's like 15 or 20 people fighting our main characters on horseback here. I mean, Galassi is working hard for his money here and he's selling this stuff credibly, but it just looks like an enormous amount of work and time and effort went into these pages. And yeah, and they're terrific. And you're right that his style was super fully formed. Like, you know, of course it gets, you know, refined over the years, but this is clearly identifiable as the work of uniquely Paul, Paul Galassi. And he's only 25 years old. And that's pretty remarkable to have such a fully formed signature style that is, you know, this accomplished at such a relatively young age. Yeah. It's really, really stunning work. Yeah. I mean, the, th the thing about his work is that, um, I mean, but, but talking about that climax, I think what's interesting about you, look, there's a guy, I forget his name, it was some artist, he's some German guy, it was, it's like Clay, not, it's not Clay, but it's, it's Clee maybe, I don't know, but like, but he was drawing horses and centaurs, <laughs> and you're right, that is, like, it is the hardest thing to draw, because, the, yeah. because, because the, their muscles mm -hmm. are like, they're always on display. You know, yep. with horses, you know, like the the chest muscle, the leg, the big ass thighs. You know, if you, if, if 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 you make a move, they're gonna look wrong. And the bone structure in the leg, like with the uh, like the ankle, the like all that is so hard to do to sell it. Yep. And there's not a frame in there where he, or a drawing or where the horses don't look real. And you, right. I mean, there's there's a cup like on that. There's that one thing like, right before they fall onto the train track. Mm -hmm. I feel like that page where he's like hanging and he pulls overseer off. Like, yes. I feel like there's like two panels missing in there. Like he didn't have enough space to mm. tell all that story like on that. Cause he's, cause, cause, cause you see how he's like knocked down and this, you know, he's hanging from the, he's hanging off the ledge, you know? I'm, I'm yeah. Kinda yeah. Like, kinda like, how did that happen? Like, when did he get, was like, when did they get on the ledge like that? But just that little moment till they falling off the thing, falling down. Like, I felt like he, I felt like he, he didn't know how to do that page, just that page. This is in an issue in issue two. Issue two, maybe like maybe like page sixteen or seventeen or something like that. Mm. Right near the end. Okay, uh, I'm, maybe I'm looking for it. Closer. But you but you but you see where it's like let me see if I can find it in the, in the thing I was looking at. But you see where you're but you see it's um it's one of those things where you're like, oh what uh let's see, it's not page Oh, I, I, I think it's page 14. Page 14 of issue two. Okay, cool. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to yeah, look at Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, okay, it, yeah, page 14 in issue two, right? So at the top, okay. it's like the overseer and him are fighting, and overseer is like slicing him across the chest like with his sword. Oh, by the way, that's something I think is fascinating about this. And it's something that makes sense, right? Like there's nuclear holocaust. So, there, so the weapons are either some energy weapons or they're swords. Hmm. And because you're like, oh, yeah, they're not going to have guns because guns, I mean, there are guns, like a few bullet guns, but right. bullets would be so rare because there's no company to make them, you know, and, oh, and, and there's right. always going to be fine gunpowder that is kind of like, what the fuck is going on here? You know, it's, it's pretty, it's interesting. So, right. So, so, so if you look here, like on page 14, uh, you know, like they're fighting. He's he's going up those stairs. He's getting ready to go outside. You know, like you know, like like their blades like clash together. Then then overseer foot sweeps him right. In in the next panel, oh, yeah. yeah. In the next panel, he's just on the ground, reaching for a sword that's being is being stepped on. Right. Right. And in the next panel, he's hanging off a ledge. Oh yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Oh, you're right. Yeah, yeah that and, is and, weird. And I'm kind of like, oh, like, like, like you missed the panel where his like jaw got kicked, maybe, and he rolled off the edge. Yeah. It feels like just that, because then it's like, the, you know, because then he grabs his 
you know, like like he's trying to get his foot stepped on by the overseer. I mean, his hand stepped on. He grabs his foot, and then they fall. And then, but that page in they're falling is a great panel. Like like those next three panels. Like you yeah. know, what I'm saying there's something just one thing yeah, missing there. You're right, you're right. It does look like there's a missing moment there between like uh, what is it, panel five and six? Yeah, because when he when it suddenly says he hangs from the edge of the rampart, yeah, you're like, wait, what? Like that's not at all what was happening in the previous panel. So you're right. That is weird. That is a, a weird little skip. Hmm. Well, you yeah, know, but I, th- but I think, but, but I think we're being made with deadlines. Well, no, but I, <laughs> but, 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 but I, I bring it up not, not because I'm, I'm, I'm like trying to point out a mistake it is, but I feel like it goes back to what we were saying before about like how much story, how much story is, is McGregor telling? And I feel like, okay, yeah. I got to tell this in like 44 pages because that's all I can do, and because eventually we, we, we might split up into being actual comic, you know, like like floppies, and it's like I feel like that he probably was like I don't know how to tell the I mean, like how do we tell the story? In for, we we have to find a way to condense some action somewhere in a way that or skip over some action because then the rest yeah. of it all becomes like like you said this wild stuff with the horses and the monorail and mm-hmm. just like it just it 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 becomes one of these. It becomes like this, like it becomes like like a '90s action film type of end, you know, where it's just really off the chain, you know. Um, but, I, but 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 you know what? As much as the as much as the action is 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 really interesting, um, is it, you know what? There's that sex scene in issue one, you know. Mm-hmm. I think what's fascinating about that sex scene is, you know, these are you know these are two adults, right. And and Melissa Siren, who's like a test tube baby, she said, "There's like that again. They're having this soliloquy where they're talking about they're both a little nervous about what it means to be naked in front of each other." Right. And I thought that was kind of an interesting kind of take for the, for him to take like in this book, you know, like oh, it's like I, this, it becomes such a uh, quiet story for when they're like, like walking across the amusement park and it gets so much into there, this intimate type of detail, this intimate kind of like fear they might both have of like, you know, I don't really get to like hang out with you and flirt with you. It's just like, I mean, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, the, like, like the relationship is kind of, it's, it's kind of a uh, uh, shotgun together because of the, because of the violence that happens. And then she finds a way to make it feel like, you know, I'm like, it, it's tender is what it is. Mm-hmm. And I found that to be very, um, it was unexpected to, you know, yeah. like, like in this yeah, book, you're right. you know, because the book, because the book is so rough in terms of like the way it treats mm-hmm. humanity throughout, you know, just like, God damn, you know, like, I mean, like the scene where, where they're raping her later in issue two. Oh was my God. Like, oh, it was, Jesus. It's, it's not, yeah. well, they're about to rape her. They don't yeah. get there, but they're about to rape her. It's a, it's um, a really brutal scene. Yeah. I think the craziest thing about that is there's that like walking skeleton. I was like, what yeah. the hell is this? Yeah. Like, there's like, actually what a is skeleton that? trying to take, trying to take advantage of her. And like, yeah, it's, um, it's some pretty, pretty bizarre and disturbing stuff going on in that sequence for sure uh that is not a sequence you would be likely to see in a in a comic book these days you probably wouldn't see it in a comic book back then either it was so rare to but then again you know like they would use sexual violence i think a, 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 just like they would do in everything else at the time in the eight seventies 70s and 80s Particularly in the seventies, like like all those horror films, like a spit in your grave and shit like that. I think that the sexual yeah. violence was used a lot more in storytelling. Um, yeah, it was definitely more of a trope, for sure. Yeah, and, and and then now, like now, people like complain about it because it's like it's triggering to people. But I feel like. You know, I mean, is it a trope? Is it not? I mean, it's such a it's such an integral part of our uh, existence. You know, our our like like our sexual interactions that you can't help but not is not being used like in some exploitive way. You know, like I'm watching that show Tokyo Vice on mm-hmm. HBO Max right now, and uh, just got a second season renewed, so that's why I'm watching the rest of it because I I didn't want to watch the rest of it when I felt there wasn't going to be, there wasn't going to be a second season, but there's this, there's this moment where this woman's being sexually blackmailed 
and you know this guy just wants to like i mean he's come to find her like she's like a a criminal she stole some money and all this kind of stuff Mm -hmm. and she just and and he tries to pay and she's like here's the money i'm paying you twice what they paid you to find me back off and he's like i don't want your money and and she's Mm -hmm. like what do you want and he is like i want you to come over here tomorrow you know showered and in a nice dress and it's like and she's like get the fuck out of here you're like oh He's trying to like, t- you know, it's like, again, there's se- sexualized violence. And I'm like, it's not in your face, but you know, that's what's happening. Like, and I just, it's interesting to see the way that right. McGregor's able to mix it in this, with this really, really tender moment in issue one. And then like some of, str- cause the, the first person to attack her, M- Melissa Siren in issue two is the guy Grouse, you know, the, 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 uh, um, yeah, the half, uh, animal uh, hybrid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was like licking her neck and like squeezing her. It's just like you're like, what the fuck is this, man? It's it's pretty crazy. Like you said, psychedelic yeah. is how you got to describe this. Yeah, describe I mean, this? yeah. When you've got uh, skeletons, like like skele- <laughs> evil, evil skeleton men sexually attacking people, and half man, half cat rat hybrids also like it's um there's a lot going on and we haven't even mentioned the fact that the the main villain the overseer spends the whole damn story dressed like a in a roman gladiatorial sort of a outfit like is that how you would describe that chris yes for sure yeah yeah and he also happens to have a face that is like half skull it looks like behind his mask and atop his golden head he's got some kind of like a like a i don't know like a little sculpture of an iguana or like some sort of like lizard creature on top of his helmet i mean there's a lot going on a lot of visual interest here um and there's like you know people with like cybernetic sort of like machine robot parts running around it's a wild future in the in the crazy world of 2018 chris yeah well well i i I, so the overseer this I, I you know what I didn't read I didn't reread this panel or but it, it said okay number one like his took of his face right his face the part of his face is that's covered by the helmet mm-hmm. is supposed to be a computer right this is like a computer brain that right? what that is okay I might have missed I mean, that they said that earlier on but then then someone said later on he's already dead he's like a zombie. They were they they were saying some. Let me see where that was. It was somewhere in like issue one. They were. Some, let me see where this is. I couldn't understand this, and I was like, I was like, what are you talking about? This man is half dead. Um, <laughs> see, he came in new individuals. Uh, uh, red tape program. It wants to capture a man. Affects my life. How would you know a protocol? Uh, blah, blah blah. So that's page eleven. I think it might be on. That's. I mean, like all the stuff when they're walking to the little garden, where like when when Saber and 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 uh, and Melissa are like. That's yeah. Such a, it's such a it's such a, a weird kind of like like interlude. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, oh, here it is. Here it is. It's on. And page it's like 15, right, right like near the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Page, page, it says okay, okay. You know, like they get the scream from uh, the overseer, and this guy mm-hmm. says, and one of his technicians says. That guy weirds me out. He let his body die, right? But then he, but then the medics keep his mind alive so he can feel what it's like when your body decays. Oh, that's right. Yes, yeah, that is and really so, creepy. Uh, you know, because 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 when you see the overseer, like his face, like he's looking like his face looks like it's like you can see part of his jawline, like his nose is missing, like his, you know, it's, it's almost like a skull beneath it. Yeah. You know, it's it's really it's it's crazy. Like, uh, you know, this reminds me of now that I'm looking at this, um, the Warriors. Oh yeah. I don't know why this is reminding me of the. Maybe it's the way that he's drawn, like the way he's drawn Saber at the bottom of this page on page thirteen when when him, him and Melissa are walking across, climbing down. I mean, what I love about it, this is just like the, the like the world decay. Like there's nothing more interesting to me than like the decayed world, um, and and then they draw it with such detail. You see, like really draws with detail, and then they go and like meet those mermaids, and I can't. I mean, again, is is, is that like? This is just so wild. 
it's so wild because again he has that kind of like um they're in a, they're in this future where they've like learned how to create you know like when he calls them animatronics right like he says that because 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 later yeah. on when yeah. like when grouse is about to rape um well he's in the middle of sexually assaulting like melissa she grabs that whip from him and like smacks him across the neck and his head pops off and he's just a robot you know and i was just like i was right. like what is going that on that surprised here? the fuck out of me yeah i was like wait a second the the cat rat is a robot like that shocked me i was like what is what is happening in this world yeah very very bizarre and we have you know mermaids yeah. as well as, as part of uh you know what these what these bad guys have done like here they talk about the mermaids here when they come across them and i think saber says look at them aren't they beautiful I'll I'll wager those original animatronics specialists who devised mermaids for merriment never realized that their scion would animate creatures like grouse. It must make Blackstar sick to have to work with conscienceless sadists like grouse. They must pay him pretty goddamn well to put up with it, Saber reflects. See, this is so much like reading a novel in places that like these these word balloons, I mean, like the text boxes are just they're just jammed from top to bottom with this text. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's a lot. It's, 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 I mean, it's, it's something that they I, I, you know, you know, I, I think about it. It's like this, right? I, I, it's like these. I, I want to say I want to say it's a uh, it's a it's a reaction to image comics, right? Mm hmm. Those early image comics when Liefeld and McFarlane and Jim Lee, these artists, were, you know, I guess it was Brandon Choi was doing the work for Jim Lee's work. They were, you know, like those guys were finding they were writing and drawing their books and their comics were so overly wordy. Like Spawn was such an overly wordy book in the first, I don't know, first year. Right. And all that stuff was Sa Savage Dragon. I think what happened in a response to that was. They just started saying less text, less like like less dialogue, less dialogue. You're, 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 saying, you're saying the image stuff. The image stuff was responding to to saber saber and stuff, books like this and writing like this, which had come before. No, no, no. What I'm saying is in terms of now, like the reason why now books are so like they're so scant with text. Sit maybe like you yeah. know, you know, like Brian Michael Bendis, and and but the style of this kind of like this novelistic type type of storytelling, like you wouldn't see it in in, in the Marvel book or DC book. No, but no, I, never. But I, was, but I saw. Remember reading some of those early Spawns and Savage Dragons and, and even the Pit and the Max. And there was like so much text, you know, it was just like God damn, dude, like you just won't stop talking. And I feel like the industry, like said, we, you know what, these books are selling. Let's have a, there's a backlash to that, you know. I think that's probably why the Saber book, when they did the reprint in seventy in in ninety eight, I think those artists fucking loved that work and what it was. But the audience was like, oh no 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 no, we've had enough of this kind of like this like this overly wordy like stuff that becomes nonsensical to us, you know. And our attention, yeah. Again, yeah. this is this is seventy eight. There's no video games. You know, there's the, the there's there's three television channels. There's no cable, right? So you know, everyone's attention span like like allows for more uh, density in the comic. Because That's a great point. Like, That's you know, totally true. You know, how much yeah. else you gonna you, like? Okay, okay, do what next? You know, you you, you gonna go yeah. outside and, and play? Most yeah. People, <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, you could. You know, <laughs> right, right. No, it's so true, man. It's so true. And it's really just genuinely so interesting how the amount of entertainment options and just distractions in life that we have now, it, it really does have a huge effect on the way that we have time and attention and desire to take in any kind of media. And something like Saber, I mean, if if Image put out a comic that was as dense as Saber today, I mean, it just, it just wouldn't, it wouldn't happen. You know, it's like, it's inconceivable that they would put out something where the story was this wordy and the verbiage was this dense on the page. It's just, it does not exist today. No, no. But interesting enough, just like Aztec Ace, my, I bet my theory holds true with this. I bet you if somebody was to reboot Saber, 
mm. today. Some right. artist, some writer artist team or some whatever it was said, well, let's start off and do Saber as if Saber had never existed. How do we tell this story for the modern audience? Yeah. You know, I, I think that it's it's such a strong idea and it's such a bizarro world that yep. I feel like that somebody could do that. Now, granted, these guys, you know, like Don McGregor and, and, and Doug Mensch probably wouldn't want that to happen because it would be such a, a, a it's like a slap in the face of their original work. But that's right. usually what happens with like like with like with, with any remake or or something like that, you know, where it's like, how do we reimagine it for today's audience? Um you know, I feel like, you know, what's the remake of something? Oh, oh you know what a, a classic example is like Top Gun. The Top Gun, the new Top Gun movie, right? Like oh. like it's arguably better than the original. Um, which which I find difficult to say because <laughs> I love Tony Scott, as I've told you so many times, and that was a movie yeah. that like totally changed his career. But it's better than the original one because it's able to – it's not that it's, it's technically better, sure, but that's not why it's better. It's better because it, it, it's, it tells that kind of, you know, uh, fluid but dense storytelling mm -hmm. with, 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 like, with modern pacing. Right, you know? right. Because I feel, I feel like this book and Aztec Ace work if somebody, like, could pace it up. You know, yeah. like I'm not, I'm not saying like removing his storytelling or anything like that. I, I mean, look, I, I, like obviously, you know, like these first two issues of Saber would probably be like, you know, like five issues today. Or six issues. <laughs> yeah, I think they actually would. Just, just yeah. the amount of story you, you're telling, you know, I mean, I mean, like that scene, like that moment when Saber gets captured and they're like, you know, uh, torturing him and they're, they're, they're burning out his brain. Yep. I mean, that's like two pages, maybe three pages of, of, I mean, it's a, maybe it's five, right? But, but, but in, the, but today that would be half the book, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, because, you, because he's being captured. You'd come back to him, like you know, like like there in the you you get these panels where it's like there's no balloon, no balloon, no balloon. Then he wakes up, you know, and it's like it's like the repeat, repeat, you know, like like they do things to, to like you said to, to to deconstruct the 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 pacing today, and in doing that, you know, the, it would be longer in terms of like his actual page count. Um, but but not more story, and I think that's where this book. Um, I, I think this would happen with the day. I, I mean, honestly, it'd be cool if somebody did that today. I don't know if what's his name would do it. I don't know if McGregor would allow. Yeah, him yeah. To come and write well, McGregor. He, McGregor's credited as the sole creator on on Saber, which is not not a credit that I love particularly because it always makes me feel weird when a, when a writer is credited as the sole creator of a comic, uh, when you know that obviously he's not the one drawing it. So, um, I don't know what the, what the business is behind that, but, uh, you know, when I look at the, uh, indicia here, okay, well, to be fair on the indicia, it says that all the characters and their likenesses are copyright, uh, Don McGregor and Paul Galassi which is nice to see. Um, so I don't know exactly what the ownership deal is. Maybe there is something of a split between McGregor and Galassi, but the actual credits on the book read creator and writer, Don McGregor, artist, Paul Galassi. So to me, that's always just like a, a little bit, you know, a little bit kind of wonky to see the it's artist. Kind of, yeah, I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of a snub, but I, I, I want, but I wonder what was the status of creator rights and all that division of labor in 1978 or well, 1977? I mean, it was bad everywhere except for Eclipse. And, you know, McGregor make, makes a point, I think, in one of his essays about <clears throat> really singing the praises of uh, Dean Mullaney, the, uh, the co-founder and publisher of Eclipse, and how Dean was giving creators full ownership of their books because Eclipse, uh, Cat, Cat Ironwood and Dean Mullaney, they did that, which was amazing and groundbreaking for comics. But I, they were giving creators rights. And so, but in this case, for whatever reason, McGregor is the only one being, uh, being given that, uh, that name, that, uh, that title. So I don't know. I'm sure there's a story behind that. Hopefully 
you know, it's not like the Walking Dead kind of story where that, you know, wound well, up. Well, what's, what's interesting is, I mean, look, you know, like in reading it, you know, like Galacy just did the graphic novel and, mm-hmm. and, and did the first two issues. When that's right, issue that's three, right. It's a different artist. You you Billy know? Graham, is it Billy Graham who comes in? Yeah, Billy Graham, yeah. So it's yeah. possible that, you know, there was some, some, um, some consternation between the two mm-hmm. of them after that the original graphic novel because obviously you know like Goisi was not trying to do the rest of the, the next twelve right. issues right 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 you know um, I I wish there's there are some say them some big interviews online with Don McGregor talking about Saber and uh, I wish I had uh, taken the time to read some of those uh, before we recorded today but I'm sure there's some good stories behind all of this. Um, yeah. This is interesting. Yeah. Well, Saber, I mean, I, Saber was almost brought back. This is interesting. This is a listing from nine years ago, Chris. Um, Saber was almost brought back. It looks like by Don McGregor, the writer of the original series, and it was to be illustrated by Trevor Von Eden nine what? years ago. Yeah, and they were trying to get funding on Kickstarter. I'm just seeing this here. That's crazy. That's a uh, that's wild. Trevor was doing it with Don on Kickstarter. I don't know if this ever got funded, but there's a whole interview with McGregor from nine years ago talking about this here. Let me. There's no way it got funded because. Let me click on the campaign here. Oh, yeah, it fell short. They were asking for 17,000 and they only got 11,618. Oh, man, that's a shame. That's a real tragedy. It was supposed to be called Saber the Early Future Years graphic novel by Don McGregor and Trevor Von Eden. Saber, the most explosive hero in comics, returns in a thrilling science fantasy adventure by McGregor and Von Eden. Funding unsuccessful. Man, that is that is really, that's a shame. That's a tragedy. Nine, it's nine years ago. It's a shame because that's, but but you know what I feel that it is? Like, like why that probably failed? Trevor's not a hot artist and Don's not a hot um yeah uh uh writer writer and i feel also again i feel i feel the book is harmed i think the book is harmed financially because the lead is black i feel that Hmm. i feel like the people who could finance and get behind it you know like they're not enough black not 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 enough black people with disposable money who are comic fans you know, to, to, get, to really get behind. That's that's my theory. I'm, I could be wrong, but I feel like that. I mean, that's it's seventy thousand dollars is not a lot of money when you think. Of, I mean, look, the other day I put money down on this this like this uh, Kickstarter thing for Bernie Wrightson. Sure, where they were like they were doing a book where they were they were printing. You know, like I guess he did like some monster trading cards some horror trading cards like 20 years ago yeah and, there, and, and so there's a book that's, re, that's reprinting those all at like full size wherever the, the original art size was you know mm. and there's so there's there's no even comic there it's just reprint of his art and the thing was like oh we're looking for like forty thousand dollars and it was already like funded with like 27 28 28 you know i mean it was at least two weeks left to go maybe three weeks left to go mm. but oh, like, like like or it's possible for the saber thing because maybe it's like aztec ace you know, a similar type of um, time period. Um, maybe th- that Don McGregor just didn't know how to do the Kickstarter thing right. You know, because there, yeah. there's there's a way to you have to do that right to get sure. that money. Yeah, you know? yeah, that's very possible. And uh, obviously, anytime that a, a Trevor Von Eden comic does not get published, it's a, it's a huge loss for all of comics. Because as uh, faithful listeners of this show know. Uh, we are massive fans of Trevor Vaughn Eden fans, here. Fans of his. Yeah, you know, so um, that's. I mean, I mean, I mean, it's interesting that those guys didn't try it again. Like they didn't try it again. Like you know, like maybe three or four years later, or or yeah. somebody could have like somebody yeah. could have said, "Hey, man." Let me run your campaign. Yeah, you totally. Know? Well, it looks like they had a guy running it for them, somebody named Jason Sachs, who looks like he was trying to run it for them. And, you know, who knows? Um, you know, I don't want to blame him for it. But for whatever reason, they fell short. They had a variant cover by Brian Stelfreeze for this proposed uh, Saber relaunch, which is pretty dope. It's actually a really cool looking cover. Um, I think they probably should have got more probably should have got more artists to uh, to kick in stuff like that. Maybe they just needed a little bit more of a groundswell of support. Um, but yeah, I, uh, 
I hope that we do get to see more Saber at some point. Like I, I definitely want to go back and read the rest of this run. You know, I'm, I'm sufficiently intrigued by these first two issues. I want to see when Billy Graham comes in as artist and, and just the, the madness that McGregor's got in store for the next dozen issues. I'm, I'm sure it's not, I'm sure it's not going to get safe and normal. Well, here's the thing, right? So at the, at the end of issue two, there's like a little house ad for, hey, you know, uh, subscribe to, you know, whatever, send money in to get the next, more, next whatever, the number of issues of Saber art by Billy Graham. We're starting up soon. And the, and the art by Billy Graham, like his art reminded me, it's not like, it's not Michael Kaluta, but it's that style of art, you know? Mm, it's very, uh, like, like, it's kind of illustrative. It's very illustrative. Yeah, it's not at all like Lacey's work at all. Hmm. And I look at it. I mean, it looks like some. It, it looks like some. You know, remember that comic called Prince Valiant? That that old comic from the new super strip. <laughs> the like, old strip, like, it of felt course. Like that, yeah, like, yeah. It was, it was like a, that kind of like detail. I mean, it's just you know, it's like it's it's Saber holding like like Melissa Siren in some like kind of you know like piratey pose, obviously because they he loves Errol Flynn, so it, you know she's got like a cape on or something like that. I mean, it, it looked pretty fascinating. I was like, oh, mm-hmm. I want to read this too because I because I, like. I'd be curious to read it. If if I was buying this book in 82, I'd definitely be getting at least issue three just to see right. the stories. Because oh, yeah. Because it, it, it ends in a way where it's so like, um, it's such an open-ended ending, you know? Like, yep. I mean, look, I mean, like he, he defeats the overseer and then it cuts to like, what, like two months later or six months later, whatever it is, like the last page. And, it's, and, it's, and he's like, hey, you know, people have found me and they're a day away you know, from a day's ride away. So you have to go away and I'm going to go out to these people. And she's pregnant with this child. So maybe only two months, you know, two, like two months from when they, when they left. And he just walks, he just walks off on the beach. He's no, <laughs> you know, it's like, that's the end of the story. It feels like a, um, it feels like a very seventies movie ending, you know? Like yes, that, it does. It does have that know. vibe. Um, it's fascinating, you know. I mean, I'd, I'd be curious because you know to see what's coming after him, you know, because he's destroyed the overseer. He, you know, he's embarrassed the overseer in front of these people who are trying to show like his synchronization, his synchron, his synchronization technique, right. which makes every it, it's it's the, the whole story is about conformity, you know, which I kind of love, and it's like that's the main thing that he's talking about in that opening essay. The yeah, interview. yeah, like, yeah. That's a great point. There's like a real kind of holographic unity between what the story's about, what Saber, the character's dealing with, and what McGregor, the writer in real life, is railing against. That's a great point, yeah. Chris. Yeah, because he's just like, I can't deal with the bullshit, and I want this different, and I and and it's, you know, and I mean, it, I mean, you know, it's like, I mean, like honestly, like, could you even do Saber as a TV series or a movie? Maybe, Maybe like a Netflix TV series. I don't know. Well, it's pretty. It's a wild TV series too. I mean, like you could. I mean, if they did, if they did. I mean, they did Squid Game. <laughs> if they did, not, no, but if they did Cowboy Bebop, mm-hmm. which was like this, which I'm not, which I'm not endorsing on any level. I'm mm-hmm. just saying they did like a really weird, like whoa kind of world with Cowboy Bebop. Then, mm-hmm. but then maybe that because it, because that didn't do well for them. Um, they wouldn't do anything crazy. But I've heard that Netflix is super conservative, like super mm. conservative. Like, I mean, now granted, this is you know David Cronenberg saying it, <laughs> right? Right. So, so you take that with a grain of salt. But what he was saying that, but he was real. I was reading an article about his uh, new movie, Crimes of the Future, and he just constantly kept saying that they're super conservative at Netflix, and it made me think, oh yeah, they don't do very risque material they don't mm. like i always wish they would have been like to fill the vacuum that miramax used right. to do you know and fine line and stuff like that but they didn't they're just like you know they're the most conservative like like film studio you know they only do because they, they only do stuff, they, they'll only do stuff if the algorithm tells them to do it yeah it's really sad you it's know? really really sad we uh we wouldn't have gotten most of our favorite movies uh if that was the uh, the dictum that everyone was listening to back th- back many years ago, that's, yeah, that's really. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, it's, it's part of why stuff is bad now. But again, that's part of why I think the Top Gun like Maverick worked really well because those mm-hmm. guys were like, well, let's make a movie that's got no agenda, 
that's got this literally has no agenda. Let's just make something that's going to be fun. Yeah, and it goes back to what I, what, what I remember. Remember, Chris McCrory was saying on his interview on the Moment podcast. He kept saying, "My mantra is total audience engagement." Hmm. Wow. And that's interesting. It's just because he he he's like it doesn't matter. He he's like if I have you. Like from moment to moment, I want you in the story to the point mm. that you're not thinking about what you just saw and and, and you're not anticipating what's going to happen in the next like f- 30 seconds, two minutes. I'm like, I need you right there. And that wants you present. That, yeah, I, I want you present. That means that he doesn't necessarily follow a lot of like the the structural rule. I mean, yes, he's got his beginning, middle, and end, but all these other you know storytelling tricks and ups and downs and blah blah blah. He doesn't, he doesn't follow any of that because he knows that. And actually, the the really really good writers know this. And it's like I just, just follow and be in where I am right now. Don't worry about what happened like five minutes ago. I mean, look, because because he hasn't forgotten about it, so yeah. it's still in the story. It's not like he's just like saying, "Oh, forget it, forget it, forget it." But it's like, "Hey, just stay, stay with me now, stay with me now, stay with me now, stay with me now." And that's something that he did really, really well in that movie. And I think that's sort of something that McGregor was doing in this book because you have to like, it's so much text. It and, and I'm not saying that in a pejorative way, but it's like he's like throwing volumes at you to keep you interested like you can't really like flip yes. ahead if you flip yeah. ahead too quick you be like, what the fuck like where are we yeah yeah no he he totally is and i i can't help but think that you know some of the writers that we'll see later from like the the british invasion in comics uh later in the 80s i can't help but think a lot of those guys did grow up reading mcgregor as well because when you get to somebody like pete milligan writing screamer you know which we covered on an earlier episode you know one of the things that we were kind of ooing and awing over was like the incredible sometimes florid but really poetic and you know judicious use of like prose and like captions from milligan where he was writing these really evocative sort of text pieces and and you know text boxes and whatnot uh for for screamer and i i can't help but think that the dna of that kind of writing it is in this don mcgregor work from the 70s and early 80s where McGregor, McGregor's going to town on this stuff. And of course, he was a well-known writer who wrote uh, for Marvel, uh, had lengthy runs on you know, Black Panther. And uh, I think he co-created the character uh, Kill Raven, if I'm not mistaken, with yeah. P. Craig, P. Craig Russell in the 70s. And you know, McGregor went on to also have some more indie work, um, like he did a thing called Detectives Inc. with Gene Colan, which I think was which was also through Eclipse. And then over at DC, he had another detective book, Nathaniel Dusk, which had yeah. two volumes, also with Gene Colan. And those were books where McGregor was still kind of pushing the boundaries too. And you know, with detective fiction in a couple different books, there, you know, a genre that comics obviously does not hardly ever tackle. And I think in those. Uh, Gene Colan, Nathaniel Dusk books, they were published from the original pencils by Gene Colan, which was, yeah. I think was pretty revolutionary at the time. And Colan, of course, had his penciling style, which was so elaborate and so full of gray and notoriously hard to ink. Like he would For give sure. fucking For inkers sure. conniption fits, you know, or he would be really unhappy with the results because so few inkers could ink Gene Colan. Uh, but yeah, so that was like just you see that McGregor was always at the center of some kind of kind of like experimentation and like pushing against the boundaries or the boxes of the industry. And I think it it really, it marks him as like a, a very notable creator that, you know, you probably don't hear people talk about as much these days as they should, but Don McGregor was a a really significant figure in comics. And I think he's exactly the kind of person that is just ideal for us to be spotlighting on comics, rot your brain here. I mean, like that's, I think like you were saying earlier about our mandate, it's part of the reason we wanted to do this show is to, to shine a light on these creators who were so substantial and significant. And you just, just don't hear about them and their work being kind of put under a magnifying glass or, you know, discussed and, and reckoned with seriously. So I think that's, you know, it's a dope thing about being able to have these conversations with you, Chris, is just to actually really consider all this work. And I'm, I'm looking at this last uh, text piece in the Sabre number two, which is kind of interesting. And it gives you a little insight into what McGregor was thinking at the time. And this is a little note for the readers here which also touches on some of the provocative subject matter, quote unquote, in the story. And McGregor says here, with the advent of our second issue, I wanted to have the opportunity to address you readers directly. It's amazing 
typical comic book hyperbole, that the printing of Saber as a color comic has brought a whole new audience to his adventures, who weren't aware that Saber was originally published in 78 as a black and white graphic album. We have already received a couple letters from readers who think that he's new on the scene. And here I thought our original ad coverage for Saber reached everybody who was even remotely interested in comics. We have had some initial feedback from a few dealers who are suddenly concerned that there is a sexual element in Saber. So that's interesting here. He's talking about the sexual element being what's causing you. concern. Not, not, he's not explicitly saying the racial element, but that might be the subtext here. Because as you said, Chris, it's a sexual relationship between a black man and a white woman. So, it, the, it, so it, when it, the dealers totally are complaining it, it, about the sexual element, there's probably something of a dog whistle, maybe, or some kind of a, a coded complaint there. Um, and then McGregor's response here is also interesting. He says, in the four years... Since Saber was first published, we have not received one negative reaction to the romantic and sexual union of Melissa and Saber. Yet now, four years later, it seems to be creating a controversy. No one seems concerned that there are some violent happenings in the book. A little spilled blood, not one raised voice. An image of a man and woman making love, and not in an exploitational sense. And already the cries have begun. Frankly, folks, it confuses me and saddens me. And in the letters page, I'd like to hear your views on the subject. Should the characters in Saber be the neuters who are so prevalent in the comics world? Or would you rather that we explore all facets of their personalities? I've always enjoyed a running dialogue with the readers. That response for many of you years ago made the tensions and frustrations of creating comics easier. It made me aware that many of you cared. Many of you were paying attention to what happened on these pages, that comics were not throwaway art to you and me. It was the enthusiasm and passion expressed from the readers along with working with some very talented artists that were the most pleasurable memories I have of working in a medium that often would rather have writers work as whores or mechanics. <laughs> well, so again, that goes back to his being a maverick. I think that's why he's not. I think that's why he's not heard of now today. Because I think at a certain point, you know, the editors become these kind of like, you know, custodians of the IP. You know, yes. and I yes. think that when and when you get to that stage, the way that Marvel and DC became in the late. 90s and beyond they don't want to have mavericks writing shit right you know like i like i feel like you know i feel like that that, that i i hate to bring his name up but i feel like that warren ellis after he did transmetropolitan probably couldn't do like a mainstream book anymore you know i i feel like though that they wouldn't he's he became too much of a lightning rod definitely now but I, but I think in the, in the wake of Transmetropolitan, that's, that's why he was doing stuff like, you know, um, The Authority and uh, uh, the other book. Whatever, what's the one we love? The, the, the Not The Authority. Oh, Planetary. But, um, Planetary. Yeah, Planetary. Like, he's doing those books. And it's, 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 as much as he's probably never going to tell you, well, I don't want to do you know, superhero stuff anyway. I'm sure you do want to write an X-Men book the way, you know, that Garth Eno, or not, that, uh, like Grant, Grant Morrison, Grant Morrison. you get the money. You get the money in a way that you're not going to get on an indie book. And I feel like someone like Don McGregor, he's forgotten about because, I mean, it's interesting that he wrote on Black Panther about a white guy writing about a black hero, and then he's writing Saber as a white guy writing a black hero. I also feel that in listening to what his response is, the sexual element is that. I bet you look and if you look at the when that book is black and white, it's not in your face that it's a black man having sex with a white woman. Yeah, that that's becomes, a good point. Yeah, I mean, I mean, yes, it's there because of the right. way he's drawn, but if you look at his face, he kind of looks a little bit like, um, he looks a little bit like, um. Charles Bronson in the face, like a Charles oh, Bronson. That's an interesting comparison, but I could see that, especially in black and white. It is kind of like a skin, yeah. like a skinny version of a Charles Bronson Bronson facial structure. Um, but that's yeah, like, yeah, that's yeah like, like the way he's. I mean, like he he reminds you of Charles Bronson in in um first image of him. He's wearing a hat, like a, a, a cowboy hat. So he reminds you of Charles Bronson from like Once Upon a Time in the West. Right. And then it's later on you get the chance. Okay, he's. 
you know, he's going to be black the way his hair is, blah, blah, blah. And then obviously the way he's, but then when you see him as a kid growing up, and blah, blah, I mean, it's not like in your face, in your face. He's not, number one, he's not talking the way that they made black people talk in the 70s. No, not at all. Like if you go and look at like the way Power Man talked or the way Falcon talked, you know, it's like, like they talked like Jive Street Brothers and and Saber doesn't talk that way. So I feel like when you're reading that book in black and white, you don't, it's not, it's not hammered home on every page. This is a black man. This is a black man. This is a black man. And it's not also hammered home that he's not just having sex with a white woman. He's having sex with a blonde white woman. And I think that when you see that in color, it is like, is causing, is causing people's heads to explode, you know, because they, they just weren't down with that. You know, like particularly in any kind of fucking like, you know, in, in comics, from what we know, it's like it's a pretty it's a pretty um, specific audience. You know, it's not it, particularly at this time. It's not so mainstream. It's not so liberal. You know, I, I, I think it's a it's a it's a it's a bad thing to assume that audiences for for anything is very liberal. Um, and I think that when these guys are like, I think that I, I actually think that part of these people would get pushback for doing things that, that are like Saber, that are pushing the boundaries, that are expressing things uh, that are progressive in a way, is because they, the, the, because the, this, the, the retailers and the sales people know these books don't sell the most in like New York and in Los Angeles. They got to sell all over the country. So it's right. like everything else, like at that time period, where it's like we got to be gen- we got to be ginger, we got to gingerly tread when we deal about race relations. Because it's like, and that could be why he had to sell the book to the direct market. Because if he's saying, hey, this is like a black hero who's going to do this, you know, there's pushback. Like, we can't sell this in the South. We can't sell this in the Midwest. You know, I mean, yeah, like that's, that's a good people, point. You know, it, the thing is, if you sell a direct market, those, those retailers who are buying it are seeing what the cover art looks like. And they're making the decision. I can buy, like, I can order 10 issues of this. I can order 20 issues of this. But when you do the whole thing with the the supermarkets and the drugstores and the spinner racks, those guys are just buying stuff like, oh, so what's the next Eclipse comic? We're going to buy, like, you know, 20 of those this month. There's not, there's hardly, there, the oversight and the, the design of, like, what's the economics have to be different at the drug market because they know it's more niche. They just can't hope some kid's going to run by and grab it. You know, so I, 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 I would have to as- assume that. And, you know, I mean, look, I mean, we've talked a lot about race in like on this po- on various episodes, you know, like of this podcast. But I feel it's like more so with this because like this is predating, you know, like, you know, like Dennis Cowan's work on the question. Yeah. And, and yet Dennis Cowan is uh, what he is. a He is a black guy, but he's drawing a white hero, you know. And same thing with Trevor Von Eden. You know, when he's doing Thriller, he's not drawing black characters. But this is a guy who's drawing a black character. And and neither of these guys are, are, are black. And they're doing it at a time when your heroes who are black are, what, it's Jon Stewart, it's Black Lightning, it's Falcon, it's Black Panther. Yeah, uh, Luke Cage. L- Luke Cage and, and maybe you know, like Rhodey Rose, but he's not Iron Man yet. That's about all you have for black characters. You know, I mean, it's, that's, that's less than 10. Yeah. And, 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 and that he's doing such a, uh, I mean, look, even if this character like wasn't black, it is sort of sexually, se- sexually explicit. And I think that's to go with what I was saying to you before. It's not, it's not, um, you know, movies and TV that did show sexuality didn't show the tenderness that this book is showing you. Yeah, I think that that I, I, that's you know the way they talk about what sex means to them, and even after the fact when they're like when they're escaping or before they get caught, they have a conversation about what's like what the you know like he says to them like you know maybe it's at the end that he's like you know I'm I'm gonna. I'm going to miss the touch of you or something. Some great, great line. Let me see if I can find it. I thought it was such a great line um, for somebody to say, uh, you know, 
let me just see if I can find it because it was really fascinating to me. Hmm. Uh, armies haunt touch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, he, yeah. It's which uh, it's okay. This is what Saber says to Melissa on the last page of of of, of issue two. It's the second 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 row. He goes, and I wish I could stay. I am already haunted by our memories and the thought that I won't touch you for endless nights, for mm. endless empty, for endless empty nights. Like that's the kind of language that is not what you get in. Um, I mean, like it's very poetic. It's it's very intimate. It's it's not what you get in movies, TV, or other comics. You know. Um, yeah. Then there's this great panel that the second to last panel of the whole book is a silhouette of them about to kiss, you know, like in the frame by the moon with some great kind of halftone art and shit. And, you know, I mean, and there, oh, here's something else I love. I'm actually going to steal this somewhere uh, and put it in a, in a description in the script. Hmm. It's, it says, uh, it says, Saber's voice is like a lost whisper. I don't know how much, you know, he's, he's responding to a question she asked. I was like, that's kind of beautiful. You know, mm, this is actually yeah. kind of beautiful. I mean, it sets up this kind of like this relationship that I also think at the time it's like, you know, like a lot of times black men are portrayed as like being like, you know, like sort of like sexual machines, you know, like 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 the the softer nature of of, of men and women when they have intimate relationships you don't see that with black men on TV or movies, particularly at this time, you know? And it's like, you know, like this is still black exploitation time in cinema, right? With like Shaft and Superfly and, you know, shit like that, you know? And I mean, and, and, and Bill D. Williams is not allowed to do anything, you know, really sexual, but he's like the big star of the time. And it's like, but Don McGregor and Galaxy are like, they're so pushing the envelope and they're so like making this guy so human, like, like in a way that you were not seeing in any other kind of like medium. Cause even in like the, some of those, you know, like some of the stuff with Jim Brown, you know, the, or I, the Isaac Hayes stuff or the, like all that black exploitation, the way, and those things are very sexual, like Pam Gear and stuff like that. There's like a, there's a, there's a hard edge to the sexuality and the way that they behave. Like John Shaft, like, yeah, like he's the sex machine, like it says, like in a thing, but he's never like tender with his women, you know, right, like, right. Well, like in the book or in the movies and stuff like that. You know I mean? He's so kind of like, they're almost disposable to him, you know, and that's not the case here. And then it happens to be with a white woman. And I think that's just like, and you know fascinating and she's gonna have his child so it's like yeah it, yeah i mean there's like a lot to this at the end where i could see where the readers would be like what the fuck are you doing don i don't know yeah. what, i mean <laughs> I, I like i could just see like the hate mail coming in and, well and, and i think I, I didn't read it and i haven't read the rest of the run but i know that one of the later issues of saber in this run is is quite famous and it's like it's known as the birth issue where um you know uh i think she gives she gives birth to saber's child and i think it's a fairly explicit for comics depiction of the birth of the child and saber's like literally pulling out the baby with the, umbil the umbilical cord and like holding it holding it in the air like i've seen the page from the book and i think that was considered a really risky sort of thing in comics to show the birth of a child, you know, from this mixed couple in the comic. And, you know, again, the book is just, it's pushing boundaries. And uh, I think it's one of the really admirable things about Saber. It was a, it was a comic well ahead of its time. And you can tell yeah. that Don McGregor had to fight hard to get this book out there. Uh, oh yeah. I mean, it's evident in everything he's saying about it. I mean, look, I haven't heard about that page or that panel, or that sequence, but it's like, you know, I'm sh this is early '80s, so this book only ran what 14 issues. So it ran from August from, from '82 to what's that? To just to October of '83. Yep. You know, but, I mean, so it was done. So I mean, that kind of to show a, a like a birth in comics probably doesn't really show up until you do 
like an actual birth birthing type of scene is sorry until you get in the vertigo yeah you know? like probably that's so that's that's 10 years later right you know so he's like a whole full generation of comic like comic stuff he's doing something that people are not able to do you know i'm sure people wanted to do it in other stuff but I'm sure it was edited out. I'm sure, people read that in, the, in, the, in this. The editors were like, "You're not gonna, you're not gonna write this. You're not gonna, you're not gonna get attempt to draw this." Yeah. No, for um, sure. That's wild. Yeah. That's fucking wild. Yeah, I mean, this is a this is a very noteworthy book uh, for a lot of reasons, historically and and also just the actual content of it. It's a it's a fascinating piece of work, and you know, it's something everyone should check out. Uh, Saber is a challenging read, but you know, nowhere near as challenging as Aztec Ace, for example, as just on the spectrum of '80s comics. And you know, like. Like everything we've been talking about here today, it's it's a hell of an example of what you can do in the comics medium. And just it's a bizarre, wild, futuristic story that, uh, you know, today it seems charming that it's set in 2018. But, you know, back then this was some some wild speculative fiction about the future. And and by the way, I just want to note that I love that when they're talking about 2018 in the comic, Chris, um, it's the, the actual year is written with a comma after the two. So it's like yeah, I know. I know. I know. I know. Far I know. Long future of 2018, <laughs> but with a comma after the two, because they thought that's how the date was going to be written. I thought that was wild. Yeah, that was pretty funny. I, I, I mean, but but I mean, I, I think what's interesting is you know it's always funny when you see stuff from like the late seventies and early eighties of how they envisioned the future. No, I, I just like nobody in, envisioned digital nobody right. did it like right it was just beyond anybody because it's he's still using cassette tapes the the the, yeah. the it, you, you you look at a something like um you know, like even alien you know it's like you look you know, i'm saying like there's always a sense of like analogness was like that was our world and that's all we knew and no one even could we really couldn't could conceive of the digital the way that it is now. I mean, yeah, a little bit of stuff, even like, you know, like even 2001, there's still, it's still pretty analog, you know? It's, yeah. Um, yeah. It's pretty crazy that the transistor and all that was like, so <laughs> not really considered, like it was just a thing. Like it wasn't going to just like, like consume us in such a level. Um, but you know, I mean, look, it's look. this book is, you, yeah, I was thinking about it now. It's like, this book is not nearly as challenging as like Mr. Monster. I, like, like, I don't think. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I guess Mr. Monster jumped around a lot more in time frame. So you're right. You're right. Did Mr. Monster like you and you had a lot of characters and kind of mysteries like going back and forth across generations in that origin story we read. So yeah, no, you're, you're right. You're right. This is actually a fairly straightforward story. It's just a very dense str- and completely batshit insane. But very linear and straightforward story. And yeah, they tell you about the past, but it's in clearly delineated flashbacks. Like there's yeah. never, there really aren't that any moments that are confusing in this work. It's just, it's just a lot to take in. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's a hell of a lot to take in. It is a hell of a lot to take in. And I almost feel like um, everybody is doing themselves a disservice, not, not reading this book. I mean, look, it's probably hard to get the eclipse. It's probably hard to get the eclipse issues maybe i don't know if how, how available they are on ebay i'm sure that the image reprint is probably a lot more available i'm sure that their that original 78 graphic novel is probably almost impossible to find um yeah i don't know i mean i think they're out there like i bought the 78 graphic novel um on ebay not that long ago but i don't, I don't know if there's a ton of them out there i'm sure the image the image reprint's probably easier to come by and you get the benefit of the the fiery don mcgregor essay from 20 years later but the the actual eclipse comics i think are not that tough to find online at this point and they won't they won't run you that much money and you'll get the the letter columns and all that so so as always you know I would recommend getting the original issues wherever you can, folks. Um, although the nice thing about the graphic um, album, graphic novel collection, whether it's the original one or the image reprint, is you get to see that glorious Paul Galazi art in black and white, which is yeah. 
which is kind of a, a different experience and really lets you appreciate Galassi's line work on another level. So, so yeah, whatever format you check it out in, I think you won't be disappointed. Uh, Saber has a, a ton of heart and love and madness contained in its pages and just a whole lot of passion from two creators who really clearly gave a shit about what they were doing and were trying to push the medium of comics forward. And I would say they succeeded. Yeah, they totally did. They totally, totally did. Um, so I guess, I guess that that wraps up this episode of Comics Rot Your Brain. Uh, I, you know, I don't have any last words. I think I just said my last words. You know, just, just yeah. Just, like, you should read the book, find the book. You you can get it. Um, uh, they're available on eBay. So yeah. Is there any final thoughts to you? You, you? Any final thoughts or? No, no. I think I think I'm good. Thanks for thanks for listening to uh, another uh, another discussion of old comics, folks. We'll uh, we'll see you next week. Yeah. So we'll be back next week with another book that you probably haven't heard of. Uh, don't know what that is yet. We'll know a little bit, but because uh, you know, because we have a whole list of things that we want to discuss. So it's not like we're just trying to be obscure but we just don't know what we're going to read next uh or just actually something it's usually stuff that we're revisiting i do want to get our grimjack episode done oh yeah 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 we gotta we gotta, but, we gotta get but, that but, done we we've got a special but, guest for that one yeah, so, yeah, I gotta guest for that. so 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 that's coming soon for, for fans and what kind of stuff that we're going to look at is grimjack um and maybe some more timothy truman who we talked about before some yeah. original work um well you know there might there might finally be a marvel book <laughs> <laughs> hey we've done, we've done epic we've, we've done epic we did alien legion yeah we did yeah but that's not that's yeah. not like like a marvel the actual like, marvel book yeah yeah, yeah we talked about doing the uh, what the falcon miniseries yeah the falcon oh. miniseries and the hawkeye miniseries and right few other things but uh but yeah but that's it folks thank you again we appreciate it uh and we will see you soon yeah thanks everybody <laughs>